Open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, is where we're going to be at tonight. Book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Jeremiah chapter 29. If you have a bookmark in your Bible, I would suggest you put it there. We're going to be in this chapter tonight, but we'll be going around to some other passages. Um, but we'll keep coming back to Jeremiah 29. I want you to picture for a moment that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you're in a completely different house, a completely different nation, where the people speak a completely different language, have completely different customs, and you are now in the minority, demographically, culturally, and religiously. Think how much of a shock that would be to your system. How would you live? Would you still be faithful? Would you still try and find some other people of like-minded faith to try and do the work and worship of the New Testament church? Or would you rage against the culture around you as not having figured it out. It doesn't take a cultural anthropologist or a a sociologist to realize that the culture in our country is changing. In fact, this morning I was listening to Brother Roberts preach a really good lesson as I was looking over my notes, entitled, From Tailwind to Headwind. And he talked about how When you're running with a tailwind, it kind of feels like you're not really running at all. You're kind of flying. You got the wind against your back. You're going. Everything's kind of great. He was talking about how he was running on a cruise ship one time. He had the tailwind. And then he rounded the corner and came towards the headwind. And it felt like he wasn't going anywhere. And for a long time in our culture, in our country, the Christian faith has experienced a tailwind. It's not that the Christian faith somehow won a victory over the culture. It's just for a time being, the culture said, yeah, those things are good. And we're moving into now a headwind. Which, by the way, the people of God, for the vast majority of human history and in your Bibles, have been in a headwind culture, not a tailwind culture. The apostles would kind of be a little bit perplexed of having a culture that was so in general agreement with the ethics of the Bible, but that's a... That's a side point. So how do we live then in our country, in our time, in our place, in our culture in a way that doesn't compromise truth but also doesn't become unloving and uncaring towards those around us? And this is where we, Jeremiah chapter 29 comes into play. Here, Jeremiah sends a letter to the first group of exiles who've gone over to Babylon. And Jeremiah writes, not that they should protest or lobby the king, not that they should try and establish a Jewish nation in Babylon or get Jewish leaders in. No, Jeremiah writes them a letter. Basically, if I may summarize it up, Keep living life and care for your neighbor. That sounds kind of familiar. I think we talked a little bit about that this morning. But from this chapter, there's three attitudes that we need to adopt as the people of God today in order for us to continue to live for God in a culture that is becoming more and more foreign to the ethics and the teachings of the Bible. So three attitudes here, and then the lesson will be yours. The first one, what we see in in Jeremiah chapter 29, is we need to maintain a caring attitude to those around us. One of the things that I would caution Christians, all of us today, is we all need to be very careful about the media we're consuming. Because whether we know it or not, or like it or not, it has a massive impact on how we view the world around us. And I will tell you this, 
News does not sell unless it's negative. And that can seep into how we think about our neighbors, our brethren, how we talk about them. We have to be careful about that. Sometimes, instead of having this kingdom expansion mindset of showing the world the good news about the gospel, Christians develop the foxhole mindset. Where you're kind of embattled in this hole in the ground, and everyone outside the hole in the ground is your enemy. Jeremiah wrote not to do that. Look here in verses 4 through 6. This is the beginning of the letter, and I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bibles, and it reads as follows. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles who I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. So the first part of the message that God gives the exiles is you need to keep living life. They weren't to huddle up in these communes or would retreat or withdraw completely from the world they're going into. They know they're to keep living as they have been living. Safe for, you know, except the idolatry part. That they're supposed to get rid of. But what's God saying here? You're going to this foreign land. Buy houses. Start businesses. Keep living life. You're going to be there for 70 years. You can't turtle up. You have to keep living. And we can bemoan and, and lament the, the change of the culture, but we can't let the change in the culture change how we live. Kids still have to go to school. We still have to work jobs. Bills still got to get paid. Life goes on. And we can't forget that. For the, for the Jews, they thought this was the end of the world. And yet Ezekiel and Jeremiah tells the exiles, no, this, this is a radical change of things, but it's not the end of your world. And maybe we'll quick little application point here before we get to another one. It's not the end of the world that the culture is changing. I'm not saying don't care about it. We should care about the culture. We should care about the things that are changing. We should lament the fact that wickedness and godlessness is becoming more of the norm. But it's not the end. And in fact, sometimes, in order for people to see the light, it has to get a little dark out. You know, I have a front porch light, not the one that I can't... Con My one for front porch light, I can't control. It turns on, it turns off. It, I, I have yet to find the switch. I've been in there for nearly three years. I can't find it. But there's another front porch I can control. But when it was on today during the day, because I forgot to turn off last night, it doesn't really make a difference when it's broad daylight out. Yet that LED bulb's pretty bright when it gets dark out. So what does that have to do with the culture? For so long when a culture that is generally friendly or somewhat in step with the Bible, it's kind of hard to see the genuine light in a culture like that. Okay? But when it gets a little dark, the genuine article shines forth. But the sad thing is, even go back 40, 50 years, we talked about, well, we, used, we, were, we were more Christian-like. Mm, not really. A lot of people believed in knockoffs and cheap imitations of the Christian faith, but weren't actually being transformed by the faith of Christ. I'm not saying it's a good thing that people are becoming more wicked, because it's not. However, when it gets a little dark out, sometimes that genuine article can shine forth even brighter. Okay? And that only happens if we keep living lives that God wants us to live. The second thing Jeremiah tells him here is they were to seek the peace of Babylon. Look in verse 7. Seek the peace of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to Yahweh on its behalf. For in its peace you will have peace. 
Now, you can almost guarantee that there was a couple Jews when they heard that kind of had a reaction, maybe like Ananias did when God told him to go preach to Saul of Tarsus. You probably had some Jews going, hold up. The pagan nation that just came and destroyed Jerusalem and took us in captivity, you want us to pray for them now. Probably took a minute for them to, to like really grasp that. But they were to seek and pray. Seeking the welfare meant that they were supposed to be involved, right? Involved in the community. They were to actively pray on behalf of Babylon's leaders. No matter who they were. You know, I had a thought the other day when I was watching Channel 13 News. Our representative in Congress, uh, Raul Grijalda, uh, for the, this district, he has a recent cancer diagnosis. And my first thought was, well, we should be praying for him. He's our governing representative, if I have my districts right. And yet, I know some, sec- there, there are probably some that say, well, he's not part of my party. That should not matter. Jews were told to pray for the Babylonian king who came and destroyed the temple and the city of God. Right? God's not overlooking the sin of that. God has promised in Isaiah and Jeremiah that Babylon will have its day. But so long as you're living in Babylon, it is to your benefit to pray for them. I don't know about you, but I don't want to see our government collapse. I don't want to see any president do poorly, right? I don't care what the party is, because guess what? If we have a a president who doesn't do his job correctly, or the Congress fails to do its job, or our government collapse goes bankrupt, we all feel that. It's not just, oh, that party loses the next election. No, we're all going to be affected by that if those things happen. And so, same thing here. God's telling you, seek the good of the city. Because in its its success and its welfare, you will have welfare. So we have to maintain this caring attitude. There's a couple of principles in the New Testament. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when he was dealing with that issue of immorality of the church at Corinth... We covered this a little bit in Bible class this morning, but in 1 Corinthians 5, he makes this point... Seems that the Corinthians had taken the wrong application from his letter. And he says there in verse 10, or verse 9 and 10, it said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. The verse 10, I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral, immoral people of this world, or with the greedy or swindlers, or with idolaters. And note this, for then you would have to go out of the world. See, sometimes the response from people of faith throughout centuries when the cultures start collapsing and going in on self, the response is, well, we're going to go build a little monastery up on the mountain. We're just not going to engage. In fact, a couple years ago, I think 2018, around that time period, there was a book that came out called The Benedict Option where conservative people of faith in this country were looking at the practice of monasticism in the Middle Ages, saying maybe Christians ought to do this and build their own little towns, and so da-da-da-da-da. Then there was another book that came out in response to that a couple years later called The Pietist Option, that said, no, we don't need to go in our own little communes. We need to double down on the radical call to holy living and stay in the culture and live for God where we're at, which is what Jeremiah is saying here what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that it's, his letter here is not that we're not, we're not supposed to associate with the sexually immoral of the brethren. But if you were to say you can't associate with any immoral person ever whatsoever, we'd all have to go in our own little communes. Paul's very concerned about having these Corinthians not withdraw from the culture they're in. Which, by the way, We're going to see in just a minute, but Corinth was the Las Vegas of ancient Greece. 
You, you, you can na name the vice, Corinth had it. Name the perversion, Corinth practiced it. If Athens was like the Harvard in the center of learning, Corinth was the, was the, was the back alley you know, gutter where all the wickedness could be found. So the Corinthians would have a big issue that says if you withdraw from everybody, you just have to leave the city. But Paul doesn't want them to do that. He wants them to still be shining lights and salt and light in that city. And even though the Corinthian church had loads of problems, there's two letters. When you read the book of Acts, Corinth is one of those few places that Paul could spend more than a couple of weeks preaching. He spent over a year at Corinth preaching. There's only one other town in his, in his preaching journeys that he got to spend longer, and that was Ephesus. You know what that tells me? The people at Corinth were hungry for the gospel and were waiting for somebody to share it with them. And yet, if Paul would have had the attitude of many of his Pharisees, the Pharisee associates back when he was a Jew, Paul would have bypassed Corinth but says it's too wicked. No, Paul cared deeply for the people that, that were around him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, 37, and following 38, that the harvest was plentiful when he looked out upon the masses there. But he said the, the workers are few. So he said to the apostles, pray then that the Lord may send workers into his harvest. Now, as the culture goes the way it's going, do you know what a sad byproduct it's going to be? And we're already seeing it. It's a lot of broken people. There's more broken people than we can even think about. People who, who, bought, who bought the lie, right, of what our culture's selling. The lies of the sexual revolution, of, of living for self, of living a life of party, of using other people simply as objects, and eventually that takes its toll on the body and the soul. Like a dick corn. And all those people are waiting for. It's not a Christian to give them a sales pitch, but a Christian to show them love and compassion and show them the love of Christ and the gospel. To build that relationship. See, the temptation, the first temptation we'll face, and this is why we need to maintain this caring attitude, is as the culture changes, the temptation is going to be to rail at the culture. I mean, really, most people, it's not that they're intentionally doing this. There are some, don't get me wrong. Paul names them in first, uh, Romans chapter 1. But most people don't know any better. They're ignorant and, and blinded, just as all of us were when we were outside of Christ. And so we have to maintain this caring attitude. As Jeremiah told the Jews, they need to maintain this caring attitude towards the culture. Secondly, we'll see in the next part of the letter, that we need to maintain a hopeful attitude about our culture. A hopeful attitude about our culture. You know, look here in verses 10 and 11, back in the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. God says here, For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years has been fulfilled for Babylon, I will visit you and establish my good word to you to return you to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for peace and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, contextually, this promise here is for the Jews, for those Jews going to exile. And God gives them this, that yes, they're going to exile because of their sins. Yes, they're going to be there for 70 years, but he tells them, he reminds them it's only going to be for 70 years. He reminds them that God's ultimate purpose in the exile is to bring them back to him. Now, I'm not going to apply these verses because these verses are for them. But there's a principle here. In every day and age, no matter what time you're living in, no matter what culture you're living in, the same God who had the plans and was in control of the exile and the Jews returning back to Jerusalem is the same God in charge of all of our destinies. 
He is absolutely in control. And us being election year, I can't emphasize that enough. And I'll even say this. Uh, God will make sure whoever he wants in charge is in charge. Okay? You have no control over that. God has all the control over that. But the exile was part of God's plan for the Jews' well-being. Because what was the ultimate part, what was the ultimate reason for the exile? Next couple of verses, 12 through 14. When the 70 years are completed, he says in verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares Yahweh. And I will return your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have banished you, declares Yahweh. And I will cause you to return to the place from where I have sent you into exile. Do you notice this? When, this time, when the exile is fulfilled, verse 12, you will call upon me, you will pray to me. Verse 13, you will seek me with all your heart. The exile was to cause Israel to return back to faithfulness towards God. It was punishment for their sins. It was to give the land rest for all the Sabbaths they had missed. And it was to turn the heart of this people back to their maker. But we have to maintain a hopeful attitude about the culture. Because I will tell you this, in our country, this is not the first time it's been this wicked. See, mankind has a short memory. But there was a period in our country where it was just, we had just as much rampant fornication and drug use and immorality. We called it the Roaring Twenties. It would actually surprise you the divorce rate in this country in the Twenties, or the amount of, uh, of premarital sex that was going on, the amount of drug use, all that kind of stuff, the, the level of immorality in the Twenties. And what happened? Well, culture shifted. They went more conservative. In fact, so conservative that they couldn't picture a man and woman in, in their nightgowns in the same bed in a sitcom in the 1950s. They had to be in separate beds. Right? It, was, it, it went the other direction. And this is a pattern throughout all history. France, after it went through its revolution and went very secular... In a couple decades, the pendulum swung back the other direction. Now, there was long-term effects of that, but culture ebbs and flows. I was listening to a sermon today, too, a podcast, I believe it was, but Rome, the Roman Empire in the 3rd century, culturally and practice-wise, was much like California today. And what I mean by that is it, it had a wealth of different religious and ideas, You name the vice, you could get it. And yet, somehow, within a century, the the narrative was completely flipped. Christianity was the dominant religion. And it wasn't because they got the right person in office or they converted the right people. It wasn't because they voted the right people in office. It's because Christians were focused on doing the work they were supposed to be doing in their communities showing care and concern and compassion and sharing the gospel with their neighbor. God can do the same transformation in our culture today as he's done throughout history and in the Bible. In Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 10, I'm just going to reference it real quick. When Paul first comes to Corinth... And he has to make tents for his day job. He can't preach full time. And when when Timothy shows up and he can fully devote himself to the word, God tells him, he says, fear not any longer for I have many people in this city. That's a shocking statement because Paul had just gotten there. He's done very little preaching, mainly with the synagogues of the Jews. And yet, in our culture, sometimes we get the, we get the, we, we buy the wrong narrative. We're the least religious we've ever been in our history. That is true. But 60% of Americans still claim some faith in the Christian, Christian faith. 
Now, that's a very broad definition, but 60% is still majority. Statistic I heard the other day on a radio program. Um, the, old, the old adage was, you know, the old line was, half of all marriages end in a divorce. Turns out that came from one paper in the 70s, and then the analytics after that, we never actually hit that statistic. And in recent years, the divorce rate's been going down in this country. And when you factor in if, if both man and wife have share the same faith, same general outlook on politics, and can agree about boundaries with in-laws, the, the, the divorce rate just goes to rock bottom. And yet, how many times have we heard half of all marriages in divorce? And how many times does that get repeated? When actually, that's, that's, that's not true. We, we keep on hearing that no one, wants, no one cares about the Bible anymore. In Barna's State of the Bible, which they do every single year, the last two years, the biggest shift in categories has, become, has gone from people who are not interested in the Bible to Bible-friendly is what they call it. And what they, how they define Bible-friendly is they are open to, if their friend or their neighbor asks them to go to church or if they want to sit down and read the Bible. And I'm not talking about a single-digit shift, double-digit shifts in the last couple of years. So there's, a, there's good stuff happening. There is reason for hope. And I think sometimes, personally, the reason why Christians, sometimes we, we don't see the hope is we're, we're kind of looking too much in the past. Some of us are thinking about when gospel meetings last a whole week and you would baptize 100 people or something. Some of them are thinking about you could you convert somebody in one study. That worked for that time. But that doesn't mean it works for our time. And sometimes you can get so focused looking on things how they used to be, you completely blind yourself to all the reasons for hope and joy and the reasons for a hopeful outlook in the present. Culture's changing. Absolutely it is. And COVID's changed a lot of things in our culture after that. But it's not all doom and gloom. There's one thing I've learned from studying history. The past is never as great as you thought it was. And the future is never as bleak as you think it is. Never is. In fact, I believe Solomon said the effect in the Proverbs or in Psalms, um, do not say where are the former days where are the former days because he says it is not from wisdom you ask this question. God placed us in this day and time, and these are the boundaries of our habitation, that we might live righteously for him in this day and time. And honestly, it might have been too easy. It, many times in our country's history it's probably been a little bit too easy to be a Christian. The culture's with you, everybody's in general agreement, you're just having discussions about getting to right doctrine. Those are important discussions. But there's no, there was no real pushback. Everyone was part of a church in the 50s, whether you believed or not. That was just the cultural thing you did. Today, that's not the case. Today, if you're a member of a local house of worship, that's a unique thing. It, you, we need to have answers and reasons for why we believe in, and there is some pushback, and some pushback is good. No one got any, no one got any stronger by picking up air weights in the gym. You need to have some sort of resistance in order to build the muscles, right? Some resistance is good. So there's reason for hope. And third, the third attitude from this, from this passage here, this chapter, is that we need to maintain a discerning attitude as the culture changes. Note back in verses 8 and 9 of Jeremiah 29. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. 
Uh, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy a lie to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares Yahweh. And if you just look back a couple chapters in chapter 6 and verse 14, we get a sample of some of those lies. Jeremiah says, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. You had prophets in Jeremiah's day before they went to exile saying, no, no, God's going to deliver the city. You're not going to go into exile. And Jeremiah says, yeah, you are. In fact, Jeremiah is unique because if you look at other prophets, there's normally an exit that the nation can take. If you repent and turn back to me, I will stay the judgment. Here comes Jeremiah says, by the way, there is no exit this time. You either can submit to exile, and you all live, or you can resist it, and a lot of you are going to die. And unfortunately, the king at that time resisted and tried to come up with alliances, and God said, you're not going to escape it. And God's telling the people in exile that don't listen to the prophets or the false prophets are going to say, oh no, you're not going to spend seven years. It's, don't, un, don't unpack your bags. We're going back. God says, I have not sent them. We have the same warning. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, and this is not the only warning in our New Testaments, but Timothy was told specifically, and Timothy would outlive Paul. Um, Timothy would see a period of, of apostasy and falling away from the faith. And he's told in chapter 4, 2 Timothy, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but want to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths." In the first Timothy, Paul says it will come about at the time of the great apostasy, there will be people who will teach doctrines of men, abstaining from meats and forbidden of marriage, and that was some of the examples of the apostasy that they would have to deal with. But as the culture changes, there will be some who profess a faith in Christ, who will wear the name Christian, who will, tr- who will preach a message that will sanctify the immorality the culture is pushing and will make sinful the righteousness that the Bible preaches. And it's already happening. And it's been happening for the last 20 years or so. Uh, relationships that the Bible says are not God-honoring, you have some who are trying to justify and say, no, this, you, you can do this. Um, people will try and justify any kind of immorality. And so as the culture changes, it's not that we have to be, like, paranoid, but we have to be discerning and and critical and and think about what's being preached, right? We have to recognize that, one, we are affected by culture. As try as hard we, we might to not be affected by culture, we are. We absolutely are. And so it takes additional wisdom and patience and diligence when we study, when we listen to preaching, to make sure we're getting the Word of God. And we're trying it and we're testing it. Because we are to uphold truth. And this is the, the third temptation. So the, the first temptation is to be spiteful or rage against the culture. The second temptation is to become pessimistic. We have to resist both those. We have to maintain care. We have to be hopeful. The third one is... We will get the temptations. You'll be so desperate for anyone that is, is just like you, you might be accepting error without realizing it. And so discernment is necessary. And there's a double temptation with this third one. That in order to lessen the pushback, to lessen the resistance, we will want to soft pedal or water down what the Bible actually says. Yes, we have to teach it with care and concern and love, but we cannot change what it says. So here's some hard conversations I think we have to be willing to have. We have to be willing to to say plainly 
that in the beginning God created the male and female. He created them. That, that, that's a fact I can't change. We have to be willing to have the discussion that, you know, God made marriage, and that is between a man and a woman. That God made this covenant of marriage so important that serial adulterers have no right to it. Those are some hard sayings. In addition to the normal hard sayings of you have to be willing to forsake all, to cut off the hand and pluck out the eye if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, part of, you has, part of us all has to die before you become a Christian. That's why you're buried in the water grave. And God never said that was a painless experience. And we have to be willing to have those conversations and to uphold truth, as Timothy was told. Paul was not going to live to see the day of the great apostasy. He's going to end 2 Timothy. He says, I know the time of my departure is at hand. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. He's trying to strengthen Timothy as the next generation. Of, You've got to stand firm because the day's coming. Look here in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 4. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and teaching. And we read the warning in verse three and five, but look in verse three and four, but look in verse five. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. Paul's telling Timothy it's going to be tough, but that that's not an excuse to backpedal or, or soften it. He needs to be committed to the enduring, faithful, all-sufficient Word of God. And he needs to be committed to upholding that. Now, does that mean we go around Bible-thumping and all that kind of, No, that would break the first attitude. We need to maintain a caring attitude. But it does mean we have to be discerning about what we're hearing, and we have to be willing to uphold the clear teaching of Scripture, even when it goes against what the culture is saying. And that requires having those hard conversations. And those hard conversations are an act of love. I remember one time, my sister and I ran in different friend groups. I was the, cl- bang, I was the band kid, you know. Most trouble I got in, a, I hopped a fence one time and tore the back of my jeans. Ooh. Sister had other friends who were more into the party and everything else, friends who liked to go out to David Hill, which in Forest Grove, there's only three reasons you went out to David Hill, and all of them are not good. Uh, and my sister had a friend who was going down a pretty bad path. Drug use, alcohol use, and we're talking juniors and seniors in high school. And my sister was agonizing, but she didn't want to have the hard conversation. Like, I, I don't agree with your decisions. I, I, I think this is hurting you. And my dad sat her down and says, you know, your friends have a lot of parents who don't love them. I'm talking about my sister's friend. This is what I mean by that. Her parents aren't telling her what she needs to hear. Her parents haven't sat her down to warn her to perhaps give some consequences for this destructive behavior. If you're her friend, she's counting on you to have that conversation. And you may not, the friendship may not survive. But if you love her as a friend, you need to have that conversation. And love is willing sometimes to sacrifice the relationship if it means the necessary conversation for this person's good happens. Doesn't mean they're going to heed your, your warning. Part of Ezekiel's call to being a prophet, God says, I have set you as a watchman over the people. And he gave that illustration there, a watchman, if you do not warn the people, I will require it of your head. But if you warn the people and they do not listen, you are innocent of their blood because you've done your job as the watchman. 
And often I think in the, as the culture changes, we're going to find ourselves in the position of a watchman. The culture may not listen. In fact, most of it won't. But that doesn't negate our duty to lovingly share the warnings and the blessings of the scripture, of what God's offering. So as we continue to go further and further into this century, some of you are in a position where, well, you won't see what I'll see. And I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. And I'll have the same experience with the next generation. I won't see everything that they're going to see. But generations from now are depending upon us to remain hopeful and caring and faithful to God's word in this present age. But we're here because the previous generation maintained those things. And the previous generation maintained that hope and care and diligence to the word of God. It's required of us in every generation. And if you're here tonight, maybe you are experiencing the brokenness that this world only can offer. The gospel is for you, and maybe you've already studied, and you know what you need to do to be saved. Well, there'll be an opportunity in just a moment for you to make that known. But we don't want to close this hour of worship without at least briefly going over the gospel. And the gospel is, is very plain that, that part of God's redemptive plan, his redemptive plan for mankind is that he would send his son in flesh to live as we did, to die on the cross and to be exalted as the Lord of all and King of kings who presently reigns and is willing to pardon you if you'll come and swear allegiance to him. And how you do that, as Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, that if you believe in him and are baptized, you shall be saved. If you do not believe in him, you stand condemned. But maybe you've done that in the past and you're struggling in sin or you need encouragement. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you meet me down here at the front as Sarah stands and sing the song that's been selected?